for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri. I am an adjunct professor at the Department of uh, uh, Engineering Science. Uh, and uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to this uh, second uh, lecture of uh, this semester. And uh, believe it or not, it's the uh, 101st uh, <laughs> lecture in the series since uh, we started in uh, 2006. In fact, uh, Dr. Raimi, who's sitting at the back, uh, had a good uh, uh, you know, uh, influence on this thing when I requested him that we need such a thing and so on for, for our master's program. Uh, then uh, he agreed, and then basically, uh, here, here we are. Uh, I am one of the organizers of this uh, lecture series, and then we have also uh, our uh, uh, administrative uh, uh, coordinator, uh, Ronnie, that you know her. She has been doing a lot of effort you know, to do this thing and so on, and uh, basically bro uh, broadcasting the, uh, you know, the, uh, the flyer to you all. And then also, you know, he, he, she orders the pizza. I mean, it's going to be here at uh, at uh, three uh, five thirty. Uh, so uh, uh, we have also uh, uh, Mr. Sharam Marwani, who in fact uh, who does who has in fact built a uh, the website for this uh, lecture series. And then he is also, you know, he also does a lot of other things for this uh, lecture series. Uh, I would like also to uh, thank uh, Agilent, uh, I mean, Keysight Technologies, formerly Agilent, uh, who in fact uh, supported this lecture series since the start. Uh, let me mention that uh, right up, starting from 6 o'clock, we have, we'll be having a class here. And then uh, for those of you who are not in, um, in uh, you will not be, uh, be in this uh, class, um, please uh, leave the room so that we can prepare the room uh, for the uh, for the class, and then um, um, let me just say that uh, the uh, next uh, lecture uh, will be on October the first. The title of the uh, talk will be "Estimation of Rural Electricity Demand," and uh, the speaker, the invited speaker, uh, will be uh, Professor Soto, uh, who is uh, in fact in the environmental studies from the Sonoma State University. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Saif Islam. Uh, in fact, he has, he has, he has, he is coming from a long distance from uh, Davis, UC Davis. And the title of his talk is uh, uh, Peeling Atoms via Ultra-Sharp Nanostructures for Biochemical Sensing and uh, Pollution Control. Dr. Saif Islam received his Bachelor of Science degree in physics from um, Middle East Technical University, Turkey, in 1994, his Master of Science degree in physics from uh, Bilkent University, Turkey, in 1996, and PhD degree in electrical engineering from uh, University of California, Los Angeles, in 2001. He worked for Hewlett Packard and uh, JDS Uniface before joining the electrical computing engineering uh, department in, at UC Davis in 2004, uh, where he is now a professor. He worked, his work covers ultra-fast uh, nanoelectronic and photonic devices, uh, molecular electronics, and integration of semiconductor nanostructures in devices and circuits for imaging, sensing, computing, energy conversion, and storage. He has authored and co-authored more than 200 scientific papers, edited 24 books and uh, conference proceedings, and holds 38 patents and uh, an inventor and uh, co-inventor, as an inventor and co-inventor. Dr. Islam received his national National Science Foundation Faculty Early Career Award in 2006, Outstanding Junior Faculty Award in 2006, IEEE uh, Professor of the Year in 2005 and 2009, Mid-Career mid Research Faculty Award in 2012, and Academic Senate Distinguished Teaching Award in uh, 2010. That's the highest teaching honor UC Davis bestows on, on 
on this faculty. He is a fellow of National Academy of Inventors. So here is Dr. Islam. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for having me here and for your kind introduction, Professor Kajuri. So I would like to uh, keep the talk to minimum technical levels. And because it's a small audience, you could probably raise hands and uh, have interactive uh, discussions rather than waiting for the uh, talk to finish. And uh, I would uh, try to present that nanostructures uh, can offer opportunities for solving problems that we can't easily solve using uh, traditional approaches. And uh, what my group does at UC Davis is uh, we grow nanostructures of very small dimension. It could be zero dimension or one dimension. Uh, they are of semiconductor oxide or metallic and uh, other materials. And then we explore possible applications of those, uh, such as sensors or transistors or energy harvesting device or energy storage devices. And uh, the, the group's activity is basically on the material and device areas. And then we work with system people or circuit people to implement some of those. Let me give some examples of our nanomaterial work before we start our uh, main discussions. Uh, so here, you're looking at some of the nanostructures that in last uh, couple of years, people uh, were able to grow. They are extremely fine, one-dimensional structure. And when you talk about such thin, one-dimensional, extremely small structures, you actually now have additional capabilities in addition to what you would see in bulk materials, uh, such as uh, silicon. When you turn them into nanostructure, they start to show quantum property. And th th those properties are very interesting. And there are a lot of ways you can grow them. Last 20 years, people developed techniques to grow them. And by growing them, you can make them as small as you want. If you start with a bulk structure and try to make tiny structures out of them, the technology is not there yet to make so many of them with such small dimension and such high spec ratio. So once you have this kind of nanostructures, people try to make devices out of them. And one such device here is shown. Uh, this is a transistor uh, by Caltech group. Uh, they took a, one of these nanowires from here and put a source, drain, and gate. And it looks like a nice uh, uh, transistor with some quantum confinement characteristics. But then, as you can see, by harvesting one nanowire at a time and making one device at a time is not really the way Silicon Valley would like to do it. So we were looking at uh, possible ways to make a large number of them. So here you are, I'm showing that making one device at a time, making one contact at a time around these nanowires, make them so, uh, so different from each other. They are not reproducible. They are not identical in characteristics. So the current voltage characteristics for three different devices look different. But if you buy an Intel uh, CPU now and look at all these transistors, one billion transistors would have all identical characteristics. So we want to have them same in characteristics, and it's not really possible to make one device at a time and one contact at a time and make them identical. So we developed a technique in our group, uh, which was rather than making one device at a time by growing them, we made electrodes first, and then we decided to grow nanowire from one side of the electrode, and then continue to grow, and then complete the growth. So they're like a bridge. So between these two walls, if you grow a nanowire, you really don't have to make contact. It's already there. And now you have a source and drain. If you are familiar with the transistor, you need another contact, which is for gate. And that can be post-processed. So in our group, we continued this kind of uh, activity. We grew them laterally between electrodes. And uh, they look like uh, this kind of bridges between two prefabricated electrodes. And uh, you can grow a large number of them or a small number of them. So there will be a lot of parallel uh, uh, channels between source and drain. Uh, you know, you can say we got a little inspired by the, the bridges we have in our neighborhood. Now, once you have these bridges, you can now put another electrode around them to turn, turn them into three terminal devices. So you have a nanowire with extremely high spec ratio. And if you can talk about silicon nanowire, then on silicon wafer, you can easily grow them. But you can actually grow a gallium nitride or gallium arsenide nanowire on silicon wafer. And those of you who understand what the, uh, the great characteristics of those materials are, they are faster. They are going to offer you 100 gigahertz kind of capability. Or if you grow gallium nitride, it will offer you capabilities for handling a lot of power. Silicon cannot do it. And when you grow this kind of nanostructures, you can do it on silicon. So on a silicon platform, which is already a very mature technology, 
you suddenly have the capability of integrating a non-silicon material, which is not really easy to do, and a lot of people are really working on that. So here I'm showing some of our recent transistors that we built using a nanowire. Here you're here you looking at the, uh, at the bridged cross-section, and we actually turned into a memory device. I'm not going into the details, but we also eventually demonstrated some optical devices based on this bridging approach. Here are some circuits and logics that we built around this kind of transistors, just to show that you can really make uh, things that are not possible using other uh, technologies. So what else can you do with nanowires? Because I mentioned that you can grow non-silicon material on silicon, and this growth is really, really important. Uh, crystals don't want to really grow on a very unfamiliar surface. So if I want to grow silicon, I need a silicon wafer to start the growth. Uh, but when you grow nanostructures, because they're small, really, really, really tiny, you can grow them on anything. And we showed in our group that we can grow them on textiles. So here you're looking at some nanowires. They're grown on glass, glass substrate, and then we coated them with other kind of material, turned them into solar cells, and they're really great. They, they work for, uh, for harvesting energy. And here we grew them on plastic substrate, uh, on uh, polymer, uh, on cotton thread. So this is a cotton thread which is coated with nanowire. We even grew on human hair. So one of my students in my lab thought it would be nice to use all his uh, extra hair to harvest energy. And we said, OK, let's grow. So, so he grew nanowire on human hair. And you can literally use them to harvest energy and do other good things. And these grown materials on any substrate, whether it's cotton or uh, you know, textile, all are as good as single, as single crystalline semiconductor material that you use for um, uh, for uh, CMOS uh, device and circuit fabrication. Uh, we demonstrated some sensors. Here you're looking at some zinc oxide nanowire. They are grown on glass substrate, as you can see. So when I say glass substrate, it's actually very meaningful because suddenly your window can be intelligent or your T-shirt can be intelligent uh, uh, because you're now capable of integrating this kind of material on, uh, which really are useful. Uh, and you can grow them at uh, extremely low temperature without destroying those materials. Uh, these are some other nanostructures which look like nano walls. They are really good as sensors because they're full of surface. And when something has so much of surfaces, if you expose those surfaces to extremely low concentration of, let's say, harmful gas, they know that that gas exists there. And you can easily detect them just because they have so much of surfaces, extra surface. Here, we are showing some microstructures with some nano tips. And we found that they are extremely good at uh, emitting electrons. And those also have interesting applications. Some other uh, devices, such as radiation sensors, we currently work with Lawrence Livermore National <coughs> Lab. So we grow nanowire, and then we coat them with some other nanowires. And then we coat them some radiation-sensitive materials, such as boron isotope, and they are perfect radiation sensor. Currently, radiation is sensed by using a tube, which is full of helium gas. And helium is not really uh, cheap anymore. And the tube is also big. Imagine your cell phone camera uh, or a structure like a cell phone camera can also detect radiation. So semiconductor can offer you those kind of opportunities. And some nanowires, such as zinc oxide, are 100 times better than any other material in sensing uh, radiation. So our eventual goal, the reason we grow materials on anything, any kind of material on anything, is to have a uh, stack of different kind of substrates, three plastic layers or polymer and then integrate all kind of devices and circuits and computing and storage capabilities on those devices and make them extremely low cost, zero dollar per square meter. That's what a DARPA manager told me. Mm -hmm. uh, so our uh, uh, initial uh, funding agency was a DARPA, and they wanted us to make things really low cost, especially for energy harvesting, or uh, for sensing so that soldiers can have a layer of intelligent devices on their uh, uniform and can detect if someone is aiming at them with a laser pointer or if someone is uh, in exposing them to toxic gases and other things. Or at the same time, while they're in the field, they can harvest energy by using a layer of photovoltaic device on top. So that was our goal, and we wanted to uh, explore some of those. Now let me show you, because you're, in, uh, you're very uh, close to Silicon Valley, this is what Silicon Valley uses, which is silicon wafer. And silicon is really, really inexpensive. But then there are a lot of other materials that Silicon Valley uses, such as germanium, silicon carbide, then uh, gallium arsenide. And these are 
sizable markets. In fact, right now there is a, a second, there is a semiconductor which after silicon is the largest in semiconductor industry and that's gallium nitride. And that's because, uh, I don't see any LEDs here, but uh, a lot of LEDs in uh, lighting uh, uh, industry used in, in buildings or cars and uh, displays and other things are using gallium nitride. And gallium nitride is widely used for also power electronics. So those semiconductors are not as inexpensive as silicon. And if you want to now create something based on other semiconductors, uh, such as gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, it's really not inexpensive. And that's why people still keep making solar cells with silicon and can't really use other alternative materials. We were trying to see if we could integrate some of these alternative materials that are really way better than silicon in energy harvesting, in making high performance electronics, uh, and then still make them low cost as well as flexible. So if you if you're familiar with semiconductor industry, they will give you a wafer like this, which will probably be 200 to 500 micron thick, and you will only be using less than one micron on the surface to make something useful. So if you uh, now open your open up your computer, uh, CPU is probably around 1.5 centimeter by 1.5 centimeter, but only the surface, which is probably around one or two micron in thickness is doing something useful. The rest of the silicon substrate is basically offering mechanical support. Now, it would be nice if we could somehow remove that little uh, you know, CPU region and use the <coughs> wafer, which is almost 500 times thicker than what we already used, and use that wafer over and over again. That way we can make things cheaper. Now, silicon is probably not that expensive. Imagine you are using gallium nitride or indium phosphide wafer 200 times rather than using once because each wafer would cost uh, from $500 to $20,000. And uh, silicon on the other end is probably $10. So you are developing a technique to do that. And I'll briefly show you uh, some of the development that happened in our lab. So typically a silicon industry would take a silicon uh, ingot like this. So we'll use a saw to cut it because there is a huge drive to push the price down uh, for solar cell industry. They make them really thin. And when it's really thin, it's extremely difficult to handle. I'm not sure if you have used or seen a silicon wafer. How many of you have seen one? Okay, so it's probably not that flexible, but silicon in, uh, solar cell industry is trying to make them really, really thin because they want to save material. And uh, that eventually at one point you can't make them thinner because you have to process it. You have to put it in different machines. So uh, thicker wafers uh, in the past uh, were okay because you are making expensive devices but now we are making them thinner and thinner, and when they're really thin, you end up with a situation like this. So we thought we can make them thin, but we don't really have to have a uh, situation like that. We can probably try to be innovative and use very little material. So what we did in our group is we started growing material really, really thin in one dimension or in two dimension. Uh, so these, we call them ridges or walls, nano walls or nano wires. And then we developed a technique to transfer print them. Let me uh, skip you. Actually, when you turn them into thin ridges and walls, you can also offer a lot of textures and shapes. And if you are in silicon photovoltaic industry, you would love to have this kind of structures because they're very good at trapping photons. So photon coming from top will never uh, get reflected back. They will just get absorbed here. So all those structures, once you create them, there is a way you can now harvest them. And that's what we do. I hope this uh, video will work. Okay, so working. So here you're looking at two dimension, one dimensional structures. We grow that, we make them on a wafer here, and then we take a second substrate, which could be glass, and then have a little bit of polymer here. And then after we embed a portion of the devices, we then push that wafer and then just shear fracture it. Here you're looking at two dimensional structures. They're embedded in little polymer there, and then you apply force there. You can save your thick wafer. You only remove a thin layer of devices. And they're good because they came from a good, good wafer. And you save this wafer and then keep using this wafer over and over again to make more and more devices. So based on that technique, uh, uh, you can actually make multiple layers of uh, devices. So let's say your bottom layer is germanium, your middle layer is gallium arsenide, your top layer is another wide band gap material. Now you have a multi-junction solar cell that can absorb all the photons from sunlight, 
by giving one spectrum of sunlight to one layer of the device. So what that does is it makes your device, photo, uh, photovoltaic device more efficient. And you took advantage of nanostructure, which can easily be broken from the wafer, sheared off, and then you remove them to a second substrate. So they need to be thin and small. And when they are thin and small, they have a lot of surfaces. And anything with a lot of surfaces offers you opportunities for sensing or absorbing or capturing. If it is photon, it gets captured there. So in our lab, we built a machine to do, do this kind of a transfer techniques. And that machine allows us to keep printing on a roll uh, from the mother substrate. And once we transfer the device, mother substrate goes back to the, the processing lab. We come back with more devices, transfer it, and use same way for 50 to 200 times uh, before we can't use it anymore because it's a little too thin. So here you're looking at some of the two-dimensional walls, one-dimensional devices that got transferred. Uh, then DARPA wanted us to coat a golf ball with solar cells, photo detectors, imaging sensors, and light emitting <coughs> devices. Basically, they wanted us to have, a f have four layers of different kind of sensing and light emitting devices and coat a uh, circular or spherical structure and make it work. In fact, they were a little more ambitious. They said, how about making it fly now? Uh, so we couldn't do that, but we covered this little ball with this kind of structures. And the reason you can, uh, you can uh, offer shapes, uh, uh, spherical shapes to semiconductor device, which is semiconductor is uh, rigid, is you are turning the semiconductor device into tiny devices so they can really coat anything and conformally. Uh, we are now working on making other shapes, like origami shapes, so that if you have a device which can harvest a little bit of energy, it can, flow, it can, it can uh, swim in uh, fluid, let's say bloodstream, or uh, it can keep moving around just by harvesting energy. And this kind of shapes allow you to uh, self-propel structures. So we are not yet uh, close to zero dollar per square meter, but we definitely were able to integrate some of the structures. And it happened because you turned a flat silicon wafer into a into a number of uh, nanostructures, and that allows you allowed you to transfer them and offer them any kind of shapes. Now, I'll give one particular example of the strength and capabilities of nanostructures. Uh, if you want to, if, if I give an atom, uh, which has a lot of electrons and uh, uh, in the core, it has a lot of uh, protons and uh, neutrons, uh, the, at the electrons that are very close to the core or close to the nucleus are really tightly bo bound to the, to the nucleus of the atom. But then electrons that are far away from the nucleus can easily be removed. So uh, the, there was a Stanford group that was trying to remove electrons from the uh, from the outer shell, also remove electrons close to the core. So they, they actually gave a name, which is coring, removing electron from the core, and peeling, removing electron from the shell. And they used X-ray, which is really powerful uh, uh, photon. We are trying to see if some of the nanostructures could be used to remove electrons from the outer shell. Why would we do that? We actually need atoms, gas particles, to occasionally get ionized. And that ionization helps in doing so many things. Uh, it could be you know, finding the mass of a, of a molecule. It could be you know, sensing whether you have uh, any health issue. It could be sensing environment. It, it could be you know, ap applied to many, many things. And I'll show two examples. One is biochemical sensing, and another is pollution control. So, uh, so this is the work I just uh, mentioned. Uh, they published in Nature in 2010 by using X-ray. They did the difficult job of re removing electron from the core, which is really challenging. Now, if I give you atoms of different kind, some atoms are really easy to peel. Uh, their outer electrons are happy to be removed easily. Others need a little bit of work. And some are really hard. And uh, they don't want to be ionized, uh, like uh, inert gases. They are really tough. So uh, all these gases can be ionized if you use some tools. Uh, so here are some tools that will help you in making a you know, challenging job a little easier. Uh, so in the periodic table, there are a number of gases. And some of those are very easy. Others probably need tools. But some are extremely difficult. And you need X-ray and a uh, uh, setup that uh, only Stanford can uh, uh, afford to build. So if I give you two parallel plates, one easy machine would be, uh, between that two parallel plates, 
put one of these atoms here, and when you apply a bias between 1,000 to 100,000 volt, that's a little too high, but when you apply a bias like this, this atom will lose its outer shell and will become ionized, so it will go to this end and your electron will remain there. So you are capturing electrons here and your atom goes to that side and then gets neutralized by capturing another electron from, from there. So this is, this is a parallel plate based ionization. A uh, little bit difficult because this is a little bit dangerous. Uh, so in our lab we have up to 4000 voltages uh, with very little current to keep it safe, but we can't ionize a lot of molecules or gases, gas molecules, just using this kind of parallel plate approach. Now, if you add some nanostructures in them, then you are suddenly, instead of 100,000 voltages, you can come down to less than 100 volt, I mean 1,000 volt for most atoms. And our <laughs> setup very easily can uh, ionize any gas that you can think of uh, that we are allowed to use in the lab uh, using this kind of capability. So two parallel plates, one here, one there, and number of nanostructures sitting on one of those will do the job of ionizing. Uh, so why does uh, these nanostructures do a better job? Because at the tip of nanostructure, if I apply a you know, voltage, let's say one volt, the voltage gets amplified by the radius of the tip. So the radius of the tip, if you put one nanometer tip, then this field suddenly gets hugely amplified. So if I have a tiny little nanowire with a very, very small diameter at the tip, so I have one electrode there, another electrode here, and I'm applying some bias while gas is flowing through it, I'll have a huge voltage amplified. So to do this, the sharpest object in nature, I mean, in uh, experimental, uh, in uh, human-made uh, catalog of materials is carbon nanotube. It's around one nanometer in diameter. So one group uh, in Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute grew single wall carbon nanotube right here and then they put another electrode on top. So here is nanotube, and here is your uh, uh, opposite electrode, and then they drove all these gases, helium, argon, air, you know, a bunch of other gases. And as you can see, the breakdown voltage was found to be between 150 to 450 volt. And that's expected because you have the sharpest object sitting on one of the electrodes. And that's how you suddenly can ionize the gases at such low voltage, which is very good. And to understand what exactly is happening, I already gave you a small, uh, simple expression. But whenever you have nanostructures like this, if that nanostructure is really tall, if the diameter at the tip is really small, there is something called enhancement, enhancement factor. I'll not go into the details, but the uh, taller structures and sharpest structures have higher uh, enhancement factor. And you also have this field enhancement happening at the tip because it's a sharp tip. So this contributes to making your nanostructure, your uh, ionization process much more, uh, happen much, much more at lower volt. Now, if I give you a metal structure, in addition to making it sharp, which really we can understand from that expression I showed, what exactly happens in a metallic structure? Let's try to start from metal semiconductor interface. If you have taken some semiconductor physics class, you probably came across Schottky contacts. Here is a metal, metal and semiconductor junction. And at the interface, I'm hoping you understand why all these bands bend and why eventually if, a, if, an, at, if an, uh, an electron wants to move from metal side to the semiconductor side, why it experiences a barrier like this. If there is no barrier, then electrons would very happily move uh, back and forth. So if I give you a metal such as gold and other metals such as aluminum, you bring them in contact, they actually don't have any barrier. So electrons will happily move back and forth. But if I give you a silicon wafer, and a metal on the other side, you bring them together, the transport will not happen uh, naturally. You'll have to apply a bias. So here, you are applying a bias, reverse bias, which increases the barrier. Here, you are applying a positive bias, which decreases the barrier. Here is the barrier height. So all these barriers uh, are real. And that happens because uh, you know both sides has to align the vacuum uh, uh, level, work function, and all those. I'm hoping you already know uh, at least a little bit of it. And because of all those realignment, this barrier realistically remains there. So I'm now talking about metal and gas instead of semiconductor. If we replace semiconductor and let's say we put gas there. Gas atoms also have you know, band structures. They have energy levels uh, right here. 
you know, energy here, energy there, as we all expect, there is discrete energy levels. And this gas atom, when I bring it close to a metal sharp tip, uh, here a number of gas atoms, here is only one gas atom, uh, that sharp tip of metal sitting on the left side and uh, trying to interact with this gas particle would also see a barrier, exactly the way semiconductor and metal would end up with a barrier. So if we can now put them together, so here is my metal, which has a lot of electrons, and here is my atom, which is here, which has its own band diagram, and this atom has an energy level here, and this atom wants to give an electron to this metal. This is a sharp metal chip, and it sees a, a barrier here. And that's why we need to apply bias, because we want to allow an electron to tunnel from here to the metal, and that tunneling for some gases would need 100,000 voltages. So there is a little bit of barrier, and uh, even though there is a barrier, if you apply enough bias, this uh, uh, tunneling will happen. Although this picture is probably not very clear, but what you are looking at is some gas, gas particles, they are trying to come close to the metal surface, and as soon as they came and made this kind of transition, they became ions. So here is a positive ion, and some of them uh, 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 just get uh, bounced back. Others actually take one of the metal ion and just uh, uh, you know, dissolve the metal chip. So gas particles will turn into positive ions, or gas particles will collide with the metal chip and sometimes might knock off a metal ion from the chip. So the whole process basically is to steal an electron from the gas to then make the gas ionized. And when you have ionized gases, you actually can do a lot of interesting things with that. This is a little late afternoon. I'm not going through all these equations, but I would like you to point at one important difference between metal and gas interface and semiconductor and gas interface. Let's ignore all those expressions. What I'm trying to uh, 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 show you here, there is a major difference. When gas atom comes in contact with a metal chip, it can come as close as V sub T. Semiconductor has you know, conduction band and valence band, as you know. It also has a distance between the atom and semiconductor, which is also V sub T. And if you spend a couple of hours and do all these derivations, you will see that the V sub C, which is the critical distance of atom uh, between atom and metal chip, and critical distance between atom and semiconductor chip, semiconductor has a smaller distance. Metal has a larger distance. So this is one very important and only point I would like you to remember that semiconductor can bring the metal ions a little closer to them. Now, after you do all the derivations, you will see that when you are a little bit closer, you actually have higher likelihood of stealing an electron from gas and ionizing the gas with less applied bias. And because of that understanding, we thought, OK, how about uh, making something sharp. So we made a sharp tip, and then we thought, okay, let's make it a semiconductor sharp tip because it seems like it should do a better job. Uh, so we wanted to uh, now do the ionization instead of using metal, we wanted to do it with semiconductor sharp tips. And we made the sharpest possible tips that we could do by using a growth technique or bottom-up technique. So the sharp nanowires we had, we further developed a technique to make them branched sharp nanowires, and uh, I'll show you some images which shows these are nanowires. They're really, really thin, but then in addition to the nanowires, you see they're like cactus formation. There, there are a lot of branches, and those branches are so fine, so thin, they're one, two, three nanometer. They're the sharpest possible things that we could uh, prepare in our lab. And then we did the experiment by growing them on one of the electrodes, and then we, we, we were trying to find what the ionization voltage would be. Remember last time we saw with the sharpest object in nature, uh, in man-made uh, 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 catalog of uh, nanomaterials, we saw 150 to 500 voltages for ionizing gases. But using our semiconductor nanostructures, we saw that nitrogen would ionize at 5 volt, ammonia would ionize at 8 volts, argon would ionize at 9 volt. So that is really, really way lower than what we were expecting. Uh, we were expecting them to be as good as like 1,000 or 2,000 voltages because typically 
metal would need you know, a few thousand voltages. Even when they are sharp, they are at least uh, three, four thousand voltages. But when you use semiconductor, I'm sorry, carbon nanotube, they show below thousand voltage. But semiconductor showed really, really much lower ionization uh, turn on voltage than carbon nanotube, although carbon nanotube is probably three, four, five times thinner than nano, uh, semiconductor nanos. So here I'm comparing the results. So this is with carbon nanotube. Uh, helium got ionized at 160 volt. Argon got ionized at 250 volt, but we ionized at 9 volt. Then ammonia got ionized at 425 volt. We ionized at 8 volt. So carbon nanotube, extremely fine object. And semiconductor nanowires, not that fine, but then semiconductor nanowires did way better than what carbon nanotube did or even uh, what uh, semiconductor is expected to do. So then we went back to the expressions again, and there was no way we could explain based on our observations based on all these expressions. These calculations would tell you that you would expect in the best case scenario a couple of hundred voltages for ionizing, not really a couple of uh, only few voltages. Now let me, all, let me show you something that will explain what exactly happened eventually. So to grow these nanostructures, there are a couple of nanometers in diameter, you need to use a technique called catalyst-assisted growth. So you take a silicon substrate, put small catalysts there, and then you anneal them at high temperature. You expose them to some gases, such as uh, silane or hydrogen, and then they keep growing, keeping that catalyst at the tip. And they keep growing, and they just keep growing until you turn off the gases, or uh, the silicon-containing gases. So here, this nanowire would grow as long as you have silane gas. So this is what you see uh, when you try to grow silicon nanowire. These are really long structures. Depending on the orientation of the wafer, they will either grow vertically, or if you have a different orientation, they will grow at uh, 53 degree. Uh, so those are all well understood and known. But what people also observed is, when you use a catalyst to grow nanowire uh, like this, you actually have some contamination left behind. And that contamination would continue to remain in the nanowire Although you may think the catalyst is still there at the tip, a small, tiny amount of metal uh, impurity remains in the nanowire. And a group in Northwestern actually showed that. Uh, so this is the line that shows where the gold impurities are. Gold is really at the tip, but then at the uh, stem of the nanowire, there are some gold still there. So we then were trying to understand what exactly happens when you have such impurities. So this is a crystal structure. You could have you know, issues with crystal like vacancy and other things. But if you have an impurity sitting in the middle of the crystal, then your band diagram suddenly don't, uh, would not look as clean. It will have impurity-induced state, especially on the surface, because you know, most of this impurity actually remains on the surface. So you have a band, a band structure, and then you have forbidden region here. But then close to the surface of the nanowire, you actually have states that are not supposed to be there. And that came from this impurity sitting in the middle of the semiconductor structure. So what happens when you have such impurity? If my impurity is gold, here is my conduction band, here is my valence band. And if my impurity is gold, I have a uh, energy level here, I have energy level there. Although it's not supposed to be there in, in the ideal case scenario, then if I have titanium instead of gold, I have energy level there. So all these states that you have in between semiconductor forbidden band gap are actually very useful for this particular application that we are targeting. What you found is this. When we have states like this, those states, and if you start now from scratch and solve the problem of uh, trans, uh, uh, transferring an electron from the atom to the semiconductor, those states now would help you in making the transition even easier. It's basically you have states, or you can say there are empty chairs in between conduction and valence bands, electrons would love to come and occupy those chairs. And those empty, cha those empty chairs are created by impurity in the semiconductor. If I don't have impurity, there is no chair. And electrons will have to make transition to the conduction band, which uh, will have to then uh, uh, happen through a high bias voltage. So we, uh, to prove that our uh, explanation is right, what we did is, we used another technique to synthesize silicon nanowire. This is called electroless etching. You start with a totally perfect, clean, pristine silicon wafer, and you do a etching process to generate this kind of fine, hairy structure. They are nanoscale. 
but you don't use any metal catalyst. So they're clean. And when you generate this kind of fine structures, you can now use them for ionizing gases. And you can take one sample, deliberately contaminate it with some metal. So you have two situations now. One is a sample that was totally clean, no problem at all in the crystal. Another sample that looks like my previous sample, which has some metal catalyst. So this sample uh, is basically from the pristine material, but we added a little bit of metal, one Armstrong of metal, and then we annealed it, and we generated all these surface defects and uh, surface states. So, and then we compared the tips made with this kind of clean material and tips made with this kind of uh, not that clean material. So they are two uh, different samples. One has no impurity of metal, the other one has impurities of metal. And here is the result that shows uh, the sample without metal, uh, the, the graph is probably not very clear yet, but here you can see the current range. This is 10 to the power minus 10, which is sub nanoamp of current. Even at 200 voltages, you don't have you know, nanoamp of current. On the other hand, if you look at this curve, it has, this sample has metal. At 20 volt, you have already microamp of current. What it means is, in the same chamber, you are ionizing so many gas particles, your current from ionization increased by three order of magnitude, almost thousand times. Whereas if you don't use this uh, metal impurities, if the crystal is really pristine and clean, even under 200 voltage bias, you can't generate one nanoampere of current. So that was ammonia-based ionization, and then for oxygen-based ionization, we saw that similar situation with 200 voltage bias, you don't have even nanoamp of current, with even 20 volt bias, we have, so we have microamp of current. So it basically shows you're ionizing all the uh, gas atoms very efficiently at very low voltages, and that happened when you added some control impurity in the semiconductor. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you want now, you can sit down and then start the derivation again. What it will tell you is there are surface states caused by gold, and gas atoms here are now happy to allow the electrons to make transitions because the band gap is not forbidden anymore. So uh, that, that transition now makes uh, the, the probability of transition is now much higher, and it, it is high even at low bias voltages. Uh, so now the peeling is not that difficult anymore. We can easily ionize ammonia or oxygen at around 25 or 30 voltages, whereas if you don't add those impurity, it will really need a couple of hundred voltages as we previously experimented. So, you need sharp tip, you need a semiconductor tip because metal is not as good as a semiconductor in bringing a, met, uh, uh, a gas uh, atom uh, to, to its close proximity, and you also need controlled impurity. And all these can be done, all these uh, can happen when you grow nanostructures. So you can grow them uh, as a sharp nanostructures. A lot of semiconductors can be grown that way, and you can actually add impurity while you are growing, because that's the process of growing it uh, with the help of impurity in the nanostructure. Now, in the next few minutes, I'll show you how you can use it to clean the environment. Uh, so there is a uh, uh, device that coal industry would use. In California, we don't have any coal-fired power plant, but coal industry would use something called electrostatic precipitator. What that means is, uh, you know, all this toxic stuff that you have in coal-fired power plant, uh, uh, in fact, uh, some of those need to be removed, even in the states where you know, it's really relaxed for the energy uh, production companies to establish a coal-fired power plant. In California, we don't have those, but we actually buy electricity from other states that are generated with coal. Uh, so there is more than 50% sulfur dioxide and other issues. So what happens is when you generate all those uh, uh, electricity, you actually generate a lot of uh, acid uh, uh, causing particles, you generate a lot of dust and uh, things that contaminates the atmosphere. And this device, electrostatic precipitator, basically is a, is, a, is a pair of parallel plates. You apply bias on one of the plates to ionize the particles, and you capture the particles in the other plate. And typically, you would use 50,000 to 100,000 voltages, and a lot of metallic nails like this, they're sharp and sharp tips really help in amplifying the voltage, but 
uh, even though you are using those sharp tips, you still need 50 to 100,000 voltage. So it's initially you need a lot of money to establish a cleaning facility like this. Their price tag varies between $300 million to $2 billion, but you really need those to make sure you don't uh, allow all these uh, particles to go into the atmosphere and cause acid rain. So a simple device would look like this, where you have a lot of contaminated uh, 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 emission from the coal-fired power plant, and they go through a pair of, or a number of pairs of uh, electrostatic uh, uh, plates there where you use one to ionize the other to capture the dusts or particles, and then a little bit cleaner air comes out from the other side. Now imagine, instead of using all these nails, metallic nails that need, needs 50,000 to 100,000 voltages, if you use semiconductor nails, and some of the semiconductors are really, really strong, uh, let me show you some of them here. The silicon, so far, our experiment was done with silicon, but silicon would not really do a good job about 200 or 250 degrees centigrade. But there are other semiconductors, such as silicon carbide, which would be okay even at 600 degrees, gallium nitride at 1,000 degrees, aluminum nitride at 1,000 degrees, then zinc oxide, diamond, they can easily survive at the temperature that coal, that electrostatic precipitator would need. And some of those are so robust, uh, they would be as good as all these stainless steel nails people use in the in the electrostatic precipitator. So we worked with uh, NIST to use some of their aluminum nitride uh, uh, nano wires or nano nails, and uh, we are now in the process of building a, co uh, a an electrostatic precipitator to uh, ionize the contaminating uh, contaminating or polluting particles and use the same technique to reduce the voltages the way we did using our silicon uh, and other kind of nanowires. So that way, 100,000 voltage would not be needed. Imagine uh, if you can bring it down to 1,000 voltage, the power electronics that go with all this electrostatic precipitator, and the reason they're expensive is basically the electronics is really, really expensive. Uh, all those electronics could be designed for much lower voltages. So that way, the voltage requirement would be low, and all these, all these uh, nanomaterials are as capable or even better than a lot of metal-based uh, counterparts. So these are our partners, uh, NIST, Lawrence Newman National Lab, and others who are now helping us with uh, uh, this uh, design of uh, semiconductor nanowire-based approaches. And as I mentioned, some of these nanostructures are uh, uh, already being developed for other applications. So we, right now, are trying to generate complex structures such as silicon coated with other robust materials such as aluminum, aluminum nitride or zinc oxide and make a large number of them as arrays so that they will be ionizers where, whereas you will be using a, an opposite electric to capture the ionized particle. And that way you can, uh, you can clean up the, the emission. The same principle could be used for also removing dust from a room. Uh, it could be used as a sensor also. If you don't have uh, contaminating particles, you basically can use the technique to understand whether there is anything in the room because anything that goes to this machine would be ionized at a certain voltage. And knowing what that ionization voltage is, you'll be able to understand what is there in that, uh, in, in that room. And this is how people are uh, thinking about doing environmental sensing based on this device. In the remaining two minutes, I'd like to show you one interesting application that we are pursuing in our university now. We have a center called Sen Center on Electronics and Sensors for Extremes. Uh, extremes means anything that would operate at 1,000 degrees centigrade in high radiation, high vibration, extremely corrosive environment. And what are we trying to sense? We're trying to sense pressure, temperature, vibration, radiation, electromagnetic field, and all, all, all kind of things that you need, whether you're driving a car or aircraft or a uh, spacecraft or, or you are in a radiation-rich uh, nuclear reactor. So right now, because we are close to Silicon Valley, we already know what silicon can do. This, this scale shows the temperature of operation. Silicon operates a little bit above 200 degrees centigrade. And uh, silicon does a good job. Silicon is extremely complex. So you can build really complex system with silicon, but above 200 degrees, it fails. But then there are a lot of systems, such as industrial plants, nuclear power plants, spacecraft, or you know, aircraft engine. Those, some of those need up to 1,000 degrees centigrade to operate. And you need to have sensors. You also need to have electronics to make them work. And if you can design something that can operate up to 1,000 degree or even 500 degree, you actually don't have to use cooling mechanism anymore for your computing or data center and other kind of applications. And this is really, really important. If you look at this uh, chart here, 
uh, this shows how much energy we are using when we turn on a computer uh, for computing and how much we are using for cooling. So this much is used for cooling, which is almost 60% or more, and this much is used for computing. And the total amount of energy we use in this country just for cooling the computers is more than what Australia uses for everything. So uh, if, we, if we can build something that doesn't need cooling, that definitely makes it easy for you to uh, operate and also uh, you know, avoid this extra cost of uh, cooling the computer. Silicon cannot really survive without cooling, and there are other materials that can. So right now, the project that we have is to see if we can have sensors that would operate at high temperature and all kind of extreme conditions, and would also be integrated with intelligent circuits. So simple sensors, such as temperature or pressure sensor, can be built easily that will operate in extreme condition. But then integrating electronics around it is not that easy because electronics would die above 200 degrees centigrade. So you need to have a new approach of doing it using new kind of material. I give this example to convince people that this is really real. This was a Qantas uh, 380 uh, Airbus 380 aircraft that flew from Singapore, was going to Australia, and uh, somewhere in the air, uh, one of the engines caught fire and completely got burned. So here is the burnt engine. And uh, the pilots had no clue before they came and saw through the windows that the engine was on fire. So they eventually, in, in around an hour, they could come back to Singapore. But then when they, when they came back, they found that they could not turn off this engine. It ran for another hour until all the, uh, the gas was taken out. Uh, and what happened is they lost complete control. This got burnt. This was still alive or working properly but the pilots didn't have any control. Because the sensors there, the moment it caught fire, sensors died. But then when it died, it actually broke all the communication with the second engine, and second engine lost, lost all the intelligence. Fortunately, there was no injury or uh, a fatal situation with this aircraft, but then you probably know a couple of uh, months ago, one aircraft, uh, one spacecraft from Virgin Galactica uh, went through a similar accident, and it was really a uh, fatal accident. And all these will happen more frequently in our uh, future society, whether it's uh, exploring uh, gases deeper and deeper uh, underground, or flying more intelligent aircrafts, or flying or driving cars without uh, drivers, uh, or uh, making more gas-efficient engines. We need intelligence and sensing capability that can survive in this kind of extreme conditions. And uh, our university center right now is uh, working on uh, such capabilities. In addition to that kind of extreme conditions, Human body is also an extreme place. Uh, Google recently announced this uh, contact lens that will sense uh, blood sugar. Uh, my colleague from UC Davis is leading the team there. And the only problem they currently have is silicon chips on this contact lens simply die because of the corrosive nature of tears. So they want uh, something that will survive for a few months. Uh, and there is no such electronics now you can't really have a very heavy packaging on this kind of devices because then packaging would be way bigger than the device itself. And people are looking at technology that would survive in this kind of corrosive environment. Although it's at room temperature, it's still, uh, uh, silicon still cannot handle this. So we have a center in our university to work on this kind of uh, uh, issues. And we are looking at all these other alternative semiconductors that includes uh, some oxides also. And I'll stop here. Uh, uh, just uh, with the note that uh, the, the future frontier, while silicon is a very mature technology, people will continue, continue to integrate other semiconductors on silicon, but there are other semiconductors that we could explore for the new issues and new challenges that society is currently facing now. Thank you. Okay. In the uh, non-extraction material that you use for uh, cleaning the environment and so on, would that be uh, basically reusable, or you need to throw it away? And uh, how, how it goes? Through? So right now, what happens is you ionize with one plate, and then you capture the dust in the other plate. So you take that uh, dusty plate out, clean it, and put it back. The ionizer uh, plate remains there as clean plate uh, for a long time. Obviously, there is a process called desorption, which is you keep losing the material from the tips also. This sharp, uh, you know, stainless steel nails eventually lose sharpness. So they then add a new layer of uh, sharp nails every few months. 
but uh, th these are robust materials, but then they also have their life uh, dur duration. This is a very good question. So I didn't mention this, but so one of my goal was to see if we could ionize carbon dioxide, maybe turn into carbon. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you look into the energy dynamics, you actually need a lot of energy. You know, carbon dioxide is a pretty robust, stable material. So we propose something like using sunlight to maybe harvest energy from photovoltaic-like uh, scheme and then use that voltage from generated by photovoltaic to then harvest a little bit of carbon dioxide. Definitely you can do it. Uh, the, the scalability and making it uh, really for large-scale carbon dioxide harvesting is something that still needs a lot of engineering uh, work. But in principle, you can do that. You know, you can analyze anything. Uh, uh, because you were saying that the voltage has come down so much for the ionization energy. So even though this was a, it's a very stable molecule, it's right. really only still a little bit. So stable. even though it came down so much, photovoltaics typically generate 0.7 volt or maybe 2 volt if you have a multiple stack. Now, if you want to generate 20 volt, 30 volt, you can do that. Uh, you know, so a large panel will probably generate enough energy and uh, power to do it. Uh, the cost effective, the calculation didn't really show that it's very cost effective. It's, it's tons of energy being produced and very little carbon dioxide being converted into carbon. Even if you have them on the stack? Uh, stack of uh, photovoltaic. No, but on, on like a, a plant, like a, a, I was thinking, because you're using it to clean the air on the actual place that it's burning and create oh, carbon oh, dioxide, you have those high temperatures. Most of those particles are very easy to ionize. Okay. You know, the things that power plant would generate, mm -hmm. sulfur and, you know, a lot of uh, carbon, chunk of carbon, but carbon dioxide is among the toughest uh, uh, gases. It's very tough to ionize it. Can you make uh, wafers uh, silicon nanos on the, those uh, walls and bridges? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So to grow, let's say, five micron of silicon nanowire, we need a couple of minutes of growth. All these are done in our you know, research-based uh, tools, but you can do it in less than a minute. Uh, the amount of material you need to make a layer of single layer of uh, photovoltaic device, you probably need like 10 micron, and you can do it in less than a minute. So if you want to make a solar panel, for example, Uh, with silicon, right now, China is doing such a good job, it's very tough to compete with silicon-based solar cell with silicon nanowire. But then, if you talk about, uh, and Chinese solar cells would be probably, you know, 10% or 12% or in that range in efficiency. But if you talk about making something that would be 30%, then it makes sense to go for more exotic materials such as gallium arsenide or, you know, in the phosphate or germanium. So those, uh, the growth and processing of those materials, because the, temp the technology is not that mature, unlike silicon, are still very expensive. Uh, so people, you know, until uh, something happens, uh, it's very tough to compete with China. On that topic, um, was nanosolar using multi-junction solar cells like you were describing? N nanosolar are using a number of different other exotic materials such as cadmium telluride and others, you know, gr growing them as nanostructures. They also had a multi-junction architecture, which is mechanical multi-junction, just the way I showed. But the cost uh, is still way <coughs> higher than what uh, others could offer. So, so they're still working on it, I guess. Uh, what do you think would be the uh, medical application that is uh, for the, sen the sensor? OK, so medical application, So I, this is actually uh, In there, uh, inside the body. I'm talking about that. Right, so, so, so oh, inside the body, OK. Th this cannot really go inside your body because it's full of fluid. But then imagine, you know, just by taking some samples, uh, breathe samples, you can ionize them. And if you, if you have something unusual, uh, there are molecules that would be ionized. So every day you are happy, you are uh, healthy, and uh, your spectrum of ionization shows one kind of profile. Suddenly you got flu, and then your ionization profile is different. So that way you can, you can sense them. Uh, so that, it, this kind of, device would only work if you don't have a wet environment because you need to keep the electrodes separate. Uh, but then there are other sensors, uh, you know, uh, that you could use for sensing glucose, blood, and, uh, you know, other issues that you have. Hmm. I noticed you have a thermoelectric uh, 
on your site, so I go to application for the nanowire. Some nanowires are found because of their unique uh, geometry and physical properties. They are found to have better thermoelectric properties. And uh, if, when you uh, then create them with uh, nanowire-like structures, you also can make them flexible. So there was a, uh, there was a discussion that uh, on the freeways, you could have a layer of thermoelectric device, which, uh, which could harvest energy from during you know, all this heating that happens. Also, when car uh, goes over those nanowires, they could also harvest energy from piezoelectric property, uh, because pressure also generates a little bit of electricity. And the calculation that I came across shows nanowires actually offer a lot of advantage. Obviously, a car probably will smash and turn them into dust, uh, but in principle, you can build these kinds of systems. They're, pretty efficient. They're, they're more efficient than their bulk counterparts. Uh, are coal power plants currently using the lithium induction system? No, no. Or so is that just a research based This is so I, I came across a small business grant, SBIR grant, that was offered by DOE to a company for making a electrostatic precipitator with carbon nanotube because they know it will work. Uh, problem with carbon nanotube is it's like Samsung probably a couple of years ago made a TV with field emission carbon nanotube tips, which basically emits emits electron. Carbon nanotube itself also gets dissolved or dissolved. It, it just melts away slowly. So this initial grant they offered to build the electrostatic precipitator with carbon nanotube uh, didn't really go anywhere. We are trying to now show the proof of concept prototype uh, with semiconductor, and we are, we are claiming that it would be better than carbon nanotube or other counterpart, but our first goal is to grow this kind of nanostructures on a metallic plate, uh, because you know these are going to be large structures, and that metallic plate will simply host the nanowires, and uh, the nanowires will do the ionization. So we're in the process of doing that demonstration now. Everyone I know, like, you know, has a nickel paper and gold pieces talking about, oh, you know, we're destroying the environment and now we're building the coal power plants. Uh -huh. And it looks like it, you know, it could actually reverse things around. I mean, coal, I think, you know, you, this electrostatic precipitator actually doesn't remove carbon dioxide. That's the biggest enemy. They remove the other particles that cause acid rain directly. You know, just uh, keep burning a few thousand tires. The, this area would be totally black. And if it rains, you probably will have some acid. But then the carbon dioxide will not, will not come down with the water. It remains in the atmosphere. So the electrostatic precipitator basically helps you uh, make the air apparently clean by removing the dust that cause irritation and other problems. But unfortunately, that carbon dioxide you generate is in there all the time. Uh, so coal-fired power plants will continue to generate carbon dioxide, while this kind of device would make the electrostatic precipitators a little cheaper. That way, China will also use electrostatic precipitator. You know, that a uh, uh, lot of their cities are constantly under a cloud. If you go there, you'll not see the sun, mainly because, you know, they don't even clean the, the, the emission from the uh, power plant. Sorry, you did not address to me, but just an announcement, because I see so many interesting questions and you know, so much interest. Dr. Hong Tai Chi of the physics department is our resident expert on the subject also, and his lab is actually in the building as well, plus the other microanalysis laboratory is uh, making some of such devices. Any one of you who is interested, please contact him, and uh, we'll be happy to work with you. That's so so uh, at this time, it's now about uh, past, uh, past 30. I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Hong Kong.